So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Mustafa Al-Saeed, a security engineer at Intel Internet of Things Group. Uh, and I'm joined today with Stefan Schulz, a security researcher at Intel Labs. And today we're presenting our topic, a journey into fuzzing and hardening edge hypervisors. So to give a bit of perspective, what's the intention of this talk? So the ACOM security team really focuses on the security validation and offensive security validation to make sure that the product comes out in the best shape. And the idea today is to walk through some of our experiments and, and efforts and activities that is related to negative security testing or known as fuzzing in order to conduct a comprehensive fuzzing campaign for different security components in the Acron software stack. So the agenda for today will be as follows. So first we will start with introducing Acron and what are edge hypervisors and highlight some of the use cases related to edge and IoT. Late, and then we go into fuzzing for product assurance and how does fuzzing fit into the product security validation. Later, we start talking about fuzzing uh, road trip and walk through some of the tools and the um, techniques that we followed in order to fuzz uh, Acron and any components related to Acron. And finally, we'll summarize some of the lessons learned and what are the future steps uh, for this kind of activity. So to start, hypervisors for the edge. So first of all, what is the edge? We add the edge, we can see the edge now in almost every single industry. It can be in transportation, it can be in smart factories, things like industry 4.0, it can be in smart cities. It even touches on some of the, 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 the industry that we're not used to, like using, uh, like in retail, in financial services, in hospitality and so on. And the role of virtualization in such industries is to provide a solution for, for, for different use cases in order to have operation efficiency and a way in order to manage different workloads or what we call heterogeneous workload and consolidate them in, in a safe way. So the question is, why don't, we just use, why don't we just use the cloud? What's the problem with that? So on the edge, we, we face a different set of problems. And those problems are mostly related to bottlenecks in the transportation bandwidth, things related to storage cost and the limited amount of data that we can move from those devices on the edge back to the cloud. Even the nature of those application running on the cloud is a bit different. So we have real-time application, closed loop application that require high responsiveness, low latency, and in sometimes local authority and time-driven decisions. And for that, we have Acron. So Acron is a flexible open source lightweight hypervisor that is intended to come and, and, and support many of the use cases related to the edge and the IoT. So from architecture perspective, Acron is a type one hypervisor that is running directly on top of the hardware resources. It's a bare metal hypervisor. And on top of that, we have different sets and types of VMs. We have mainly three types of VMs. We have a service VM, we have user VMs, and we have what's called pre-launch VMs. So the service VM is kind of like the control VM that has the native drivers that communicate with the hardware resources. In addition, it possesses the device model or some kind of emulation backend that would assist the user VMs, as we can see here like Windows or real-time VMs in order to do device sharing or configure some of the devices directly to those VMs. Regarding the pre-launch VM, it's a, as, as the name describes, a pre-launch VM is not controlled by the service VM, but it boots in a separate boot path. And we can run things like safety critical application, things like Zephyr and, and so on. The goal of Acron is really to, to, to address the gap between data center hypervisors and hard partitioning hypervisors. And it does that in two ways. First, it tries to tackle the key challenges that we face on the edge. Things like workloads with mixed criticality, real-time versus non-real-time workloads, having safety and non-safety applications and so on. Even for the real-time application, some of them has real-time requirements, some of, them have, uh, some of them have hard requirements, some of them has soft real-time requirements and so on. So these applications have a very diverse nature. In addition, Acron focuses also on functional safety and certifying the hypervisor components, things like uh, for automotive or industrial use. That sounds good. So the second part is being very flexible and very highly configurable. So as we can see now, Acron can work for a different set of use cases. 
take for example the automotive sector so for in vehicle in infotainment we would require things like hardware resource sharing you can think of running your instrument cluster in the service vm and using other vms to run rare seed entertainment application things like virtual offices and so on and here the bottleneck will be that vms are trying to access and share different hardware resources like audio video storage and so on and so forth moving to another segment things like the industrial domain where we will have different type of vms that needs to run for example we will have hmi or or some kind of oss that present some dashboards for, for the user to monitor things that is happening. It can also be real-time VMs that we can dedicate some hardware resources to those VM and those VM would be responsible for controlling robotic arms or even connected to PLC devices and so on. In, in most, more advanced cases, we have things like safety critical application that can run in, in the, as a pre-launch VM and those have the task to monitor the system health or any application that have high availability requirements and so on. Finally, if we do not really care about resource sharing and we just need to run a couple of VMs directly on top of, 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 of Acron, then the logical partition would allow us to do that. And in this case, we won't have a device model and we don't have a service VM in the traditional sense, but just safety VM and user VM that is partitioned in a way and segregated in a way to run seamlessly on top of Acron. So this was an introduction about Acron, different use cases and so on. Now, when we jump into fuzzing and understanding what is fuzzing and how does this relate to Acron. So, Stefan. Thank you, Mustafa. So um, in the next part, let's, let's talk about fuzzing for security validation. What does it actually mean? Um, So uh, as you just heard, there's, uh, there are a lot of there's a lot of requirements for Acon to meet uh, functional safety, to meet uh, security, and various use cases. Uh, for security critical products, uh, Intel has a so-called security development lifecycle that makes sure that all of our products adhere to the current best practices um, and and kind of are systematically designed and evaluated and implemented. Um, in particular. You may be, uh, of course, aware that you should do a security architecture. You understand the usages, the assets, the goals. Um, and then you would select the various technologies, like you design the actual interfaces, you implement mechanisms like secure boot and access control, um, or you, you decide for particular mechanisms. Um, then there's a big implementation phase. Um, but then there's, of course, a question has the implementation been correct? Has it been according to the uh, detailed design? Has it been according to the architecture? Do the mechanisms that I have uh, specified actually meet the security goals? So there's always a so-called security validation phase where uh, there's a separate team that will perform software review, um, static analysis, vulnerability scanning, uh, all the dependencies of the software, such as libraries, crypto libraries, and so on, are uh, analyzed. Um, and we have teams, for example, so-called red teams for uh, penetration testing that basically take a fresh look at the system and see if everything so far is, has been designed according to best uh, practice and, and standards. And of course, then at some point, the, when the product is deemed ready for shipment, um, the cycle may repeat as uh, new threats, new vulnerabilities turn up, new use cases. There might be a second generation of the product, so the, the whole thing is a circle and will uh, iterate over time. And on the other hand, of course, for each of these steps, um, we're always trying to meet the best practice and to improve our state of art. And one item in particular here is uh, fuzzing. Fuzzing has been uh, getting a lot of traction in academia as well as industry. It's becoming state of art for software validation, uh, in particular security validation of software. Um, and of course, as we will see, it can be quite difficult actually to apply fuzzing when it comes to low level software, firmware, or even things like uh, microcode. Um, and and this, talk is, this is what this talk is basically about, uh, looking at the different tools and trying to understand how they fit to ACORN and what we are doing in the space to improve on the state of art. 
So how does fuzzing, what is actually fuzzing and how does it work? Um, fundamentally, when you are testing a particular uh, product or a subsystem of a product, um, you would call that a test target. On the right-hand side, that might be software or firmware or, or just a library and an interface that is part of a bigger product. Um, and in general, we can say that, that this piece of uh, software will execute in some way on an on a execution platform. Um, that might be a Linux platform. It might also be a system on chip where firmware is executing um, or an emulator. Um, and then we have test drivers, um, which are, have the task of actually executing the target so, or exercising the target. So the particular API calls uh, to actually launch them based on some input um, that is provided externally. Now, in the case of fuzzing, um, this input tends to be randomized and is usually based on a corpus that we provide in the beginning. For example, if you're testing a JPEG library, your seed corpus of, of inputs would basically uh, be a list of uh, or a set of uh, JPEG files, or you would try to have all kinds of different JPEG types, maybe black and white, different sizes, different encodings, and so on. And then you might implement certain randomization mechanisms in the fuzzer to, uh, to damage these pictures, to randomize them, to recombine them, and feed them to your test drivers that then exercise the target. At the end of this, if you have bugs in your target, you will get crashes. And these are, of course, the things we want out of the testing. Um, we want to fix them. We want to analyze them and um, achieve a bug-free product in the end in this way. Uh, without any further feedback loop, just doing it like this, this is called blind fuzzing. Um, it should be kind of intuitive that with blind fuzzing, you do not have a good chance to reach really um, uh, inputs that are far away from your original uh, input corpus, unless you define a very good test driver that implement some of the formatting that your target expects, some of the input formats, so-called structured fuzzing or, or grammar-based fuzzing mutators in the fuzzer itself, um, the a random binary mutation of the seeds will not, uh, will usually be discarded, lead to invalid inputs early on and, and not reach very deep uh, code in your target. Um, so there has been uh, an extension which made fuzzing much more popular and effective recently which is the so-called feedback fuzzing or coverage-guided fuzzing. Um, in this case, the platform uh, actually observes what is going on, or maybe the software target has been instrumented to record what it's doing, to record the coverage, for example, that is achieved by a particular input. And that coverage is returned to the fuzzer as a kind of uh, feedback, and the fuzzer may use that to say, oh, this input has actually triggered some new interesting branch in my target. So I'm not going to throw it away and, and take a new seed input and randomize it. I'm going to keep that input because none of the seeds that currently exist that I know of actually reach this, this particular branch. So doing this many million times, the fuzzer will uh, iteratively build up a corpus of inputs. Uh, randomize them, splice them against each other, and find more interesting inputs that solve a lot of the uh, typical branches and conditions and corner cases in, in our uh, typical software products. Um, and doing this, of course, you will get uh, much better coverage uh, out of the uh, overall fast test. Um, that in turn, of course, leads to more interesting uh, corner cases that are being covered and therefore also potential crashes that might turn up. And um, that's, of course, what we want, right? We want to find these crashes and bugs before the software is deemed ready for shipping and before this deployed in product. Um, finally, um, for those of you who have already heard about fuzzing, there is, of course, lots of other aspects which are not so much in the focus of this talk. Um, once you have this system in place, there is, of course, a lot of additional aspects such as the overall automation and integration of your fuzzing campaign, um, the triage of the, um, of the crashes that you find. You need to sort them out. You need to find out, uh, you need to diagnose what is going on. 
And if you imagine if you get thousands of crashes out of such a campaign, you actually need to sort, you need to start automating this process and sorting out which crashes are relevant, which are the same crashes, and, and who should fix them. So there's a lot of work in all of these areas, um, and, and many of them are also subject of extensive research in, in academia right now. Um, but let's get back to fuzzing for software validation. If we are, as, uh, basically, if we are looking for product assurance, um, we have slightly different goals than maybe you have heard from, from uh, fuzzing that is, that is used elsewhere in the community. Our goal is not to run a fuzzer once, find the bug and uh, report it or get the bug bounty for it. But our goal in, is actually in increasing the software validation, increasing the assurance that you achieve when uh, deploying Acorn as a security product uh, in IoT. So what counts in this case is actually much more the overall uh, usability of the tool, the long-term return of investment. So given that you have this setup, um, how easy is it to automate it? How easy is it to integrate with existing validation backends? How good is the overall performance? Can, is it easy to debug, to automate? And in particular, the, the developers or the software validators who are in charge of the product, um, is it easy or manageable for them to actually uh, understand the solution and extend the solution? For example, writing further uh, test drivers that, that exercise more of the code. So these are all very important aspects for product assurance, which are not necessarily the highest priority when you do fuzzing for bug bounty or penetration testing. And with that, I give back to uh, Mustafa, who has looked at various tools um, to see what is the most effective and state-of-art tools for fuzzing a hypervisor. Thanks, Stefan. So as, as Stefan mentioned, there are different goals that we have when we try to, when we, when we decide to integrate fuzzing into our Acron offensive security validation cycles and so on to make the product much more secure and robust. So, the first thing we asked ourselves before even starting to pick tools and, and, and choose what to start with, the first question was, we took a deeper look into the security architecture and we tried to identify what are the most critical software components that we should look into. Basically, we have three main components as part of our TCB or the trusted computing base. And that is the hypervisor, which runs directly on the hardware resources, Another kernel module, which is called VHM, which is the Virta.io and hypervisor uh, service module. And finally, the device model in user space. All these, these three components communicate with each other. So the device model is, is nothing but something similar to the Akimu-like application, which has two main tasks. First is to create or configure new uh, guest VMs and uh, store those guest VMs. And the second task is to have uh, an emulation backend or provide some of the emulation services for those guest VMs in order to utilize and do resource sharing. For the VHM, it's a, it's a middle layer between the device model and the hypervisor that supports the device model in making communication with the hypervisor through down calls and also support the hypervisor to notify the device model with some of the requests through up calls. Of course, there are other components which is not part of our TCB. However, they are very critical to the overall uh, system operation. Things like the Virt.io front end drivers, which is how the user VM try to achieve para virtualization, how they uh, actually achieve sharing of hardware resources, how they communicate to the device model backend. There are also the device, emulated device drivers that some of the devices are directly emulated using trap and emulate, and those are memory region in the hypervisor that are tracked by the hypervisor in a way in order to see if there are any requests or operation happening on them. Finally, we have the pass-through drivers, and the pass-through drivers are some of the devices that, for example, Acron hypervisor have the, 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 the possibility to dedicate some of the PCI devices to, to the VMs. You can think of a real-time VM where we want to assign a device directly to this VM and be directly under the control of this VM. In this case, we assign this device to the VM and then we use the pass-through driver in order to make those VMs directly communicate with, with those devices. So that looks great. So even going one 
step deeper and trying to see from each component perspective. So from the hypervisor perspective, this the hypervisor run in a in a more privileged mood called VMX root mood, where any software that runs on top of it, either in the service VM or in the guest VM, is considered untrusted. From the VHM perspective, the hypervisor is the only trusted component, but any other software that is running in the service VM user space or even in, in, in the user VMs is considered untrusted. Finally, going to the device model where it runs in the service VM user space, it, it considers the VHM and the hypervisor as trusted components, but anything outside those uh, components is untrusted. So any kind of data or code that is coming from the user VMs or, or, and so on. So that is the, the security architecture for Acron. Looking to this security architecture from a different perspective. So if we focus on the interfaces and how these components communicate with each other from security perspective, we find that we have different set of interfaces. First, we have an interface between the service VM, uh, VHM uh, kernel module and the hypervisor, and they communic communicate through hypercalls. The second interface is how the user space application in specific the device model or any other user space application that might communicate with the VHM through our second interface, which is normal syscalls or traditional OS way to communicate between user space and kernel through IOCTLs and, and, and generally system calls. The third interface is the device model, as we mentioned, one task for the device model is to configure new uh, uh, VMs and configure new guests. For that, we have a, a command line interface that allow us to pass some of the configuration and the parameters that we want to pass to the device model to create those VMs. So there is a command line interface, a standard uh, STDIO interface where device model accepts some uh, input through the command line. From user VM perspective, so we have the VirtIO front end driver that exists in the user VMs that communicate with the device model or the VirtIO back end drivers, and that is happening through um, VirtIO devices. So in para virtualization, those VirtIO devices are nothing but PCI devices that is contain some of the MMIO region and and have PIO, so PIO and MMIO region in order to emulate those devices. So some regions are used. For emulated, for emulated uh, devices, we also use MMIO, DMA in order to access some of these devices, which is not para-virtualized, but rather really emulated. And ah, so and, and, and we have pass-through. So pass-through is also using PIO in order to communicate with those hardware resources. So the last three interfaces, so four, five, and six, focuses more on the memory regions that is trapped and, and emulated or, or handled by the hypervisor in a way in order to be serviced either in the hypervisor or by the service VM. So those are all the security interfaces that we have. So the question now, what tools fit better to those components or what tools would work better to target those interfaces? So the first tool that we picked was the syscaller. And syscaller is a coverage guided structure aware kernel fuzzer. It is very well established with the tremendous Linux support. And we use syscaller in, 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 in targeting two interfaces. One, which is the traditional usage model for, for, for syscaller, which is the um, kernel module. So here is the VHM and another approach that we tried is also extending syscaller in a way that we can target the hypercall, so the interface between the VHM and the hypervisor. So what is the VHM? So let's take a deeper look into the VHM and hypervisor. How did we actually target those um, the, the code base in both components? So the VHM, as we mentioned, is a middle layer with, with some services task or, or, or some, um, some modules or some handlers that would allow user space device model to talk to the hypervisor. Those kind of uh, handles do diverse uh, tasks, things like VM management to create, start, solve VMs. It can also work with interrupts and handling interrupts. It can even go further to handle the IO requests and try to marshal it uh, either from the hypervisor to the device model and so on. So picking the VM management. So we have API like hypercall create VM. As you see in this API, we have two parameters or payloads that is being passed as part of the hypervisor. Those two parameters 
is a potential candidate that can be fuzzed. What if we inject some malformed uh, pieces of data or malformed kind of data structures into those parameters? How would the hypervisor behave? Another kind of services that is happening at runtime. So if a service VM, so if a guest VM is running, this guest VM has to send kind of requests to the, to the service VM. So these requests requ usually require things like notifying the, 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 the VHM and knowing that those certification has been handled and finished and so on. So as you see as well, it has some payloads or some parameters that is potential candidate to be fuzzed. So the goal here is first, to fuzz the IOCTLs going from the device model down to the uh, VHM module, and then later to propagate some of the fuzz uh, input from the VHM down to the hypervisor. So how did we do that? So syscaller, so how does syscaller actually work? So syscaller can operate in what's called remote mode or isolated mode, where we can have some of the syscaller component run in a separate machine and then it starts fuzzing the target machine, which is totally remote or isolated. Syscaller contain different components. Some of them run on the host, things like the Sys Manager, which uh, is responsible for starting and managing those uh, VMs that we want to uh, test or that contains the software that we want to test. It's also responsible for copying some of the other components, things like the Sys Fuzzer. And Sys Fuzzer is a process that uh, is running on the unstable VM or the target VM. And it is responsible responsible for things like input mutation, uh, input generation, minimization, and so on. So some of the input that's generated by SysFuzzer is propagated to what's called the Sys executor that takes a single input and creates some kind of uh, calls or, or, or fuzzing programs that can be propagated to the target. In our case, we implemented a test proxy that lives inside the device model and takes those input and then propagate them to the VHM first and later to the hypervisor. So the idea here, as we've seen in, in the last slide, those APIs, like for creating VM or notifying the, the, uh, the end or the finish of IO request can be fuzzed first in the VHM layer. So we would see if any issues or any crashes or missing, uh, missing validation is happening in the VHM layer. And the good thing is that we syscaller instrument the kernel or it gives the possibility to instrument the kernel. And with this, we would get coverage information from the VHM module. So we really know what kind of execution paths have we experienced and so on, which would allow us to reproduce any issues that happen. <coughs> Sorry, so later, those kind of, uh, of coverage information would be propagated back to the Sys manager and it keeps a little database that knows or that, that manages some of the corpus that created those crashes in the VHM. The second part is what an, the extension that we made is to take those fuzz input and even propagate them one layer down to the hypervisor. So we take the fuzz input from the Sys executor, try to fuzz the VHM, if something happened, we would know because we get coverage information. If not, we can propagate it to the hypervisor. So it would allow us to fuzz all the hyper calls that is happening between the VHM and the hypervisor. So in general, syscaller is a very stable tool. It's, 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 uh, it has a lot of these disadvantages being uh, well supported by the community. It, it, it's easy to use, so it provides some declarative description for those structure that we want to fuzz using a language called syslang. It allows us to do fault injection, sanitization, and even automation using components like sysbot and a possibility to reproduce those things and minimize those uh, fuzz input using things like sysrepro. The bad side for, or, or the, the downside for using the syscaller with fuzzing the hypervisor is that we do blind fuzzing for the hypervisor in the sense that we do not get fuzzing, uh, so coverage information from the hypervisor. And in case we need to do that, since a hypervisor is not a user space application, it, can, it cannot use the compiler libraries in order to get coverage information. We need to port some of the coverage libraries into the hypervisor source code, things like GCOV and so on, in order to get raw coverage information from the hypervisor. So this was syscaller. The next component is the device model command line. And here we want to fuzz this user space application. And libfuzzer is a very good candidate to do such tasks. So it's a coverage guided uh, fuzzer that is uh, working as an in-process fuzzer. And 
we ha we use lib fuzzer in order to target the command line parameters. So can we fuzz those command line configuration and see if that would impact the device model? So how we did that? Before we talking about how we did that, so the device model from inside, as we mentioned, has three main uh, components. First, it configures VMs or pass those parameters to configure the VMs. And the second thing is to provide those emulation backends for legacy devices or for virtual IO devices. Starting with the VM configuration. So how we implemented LibFuzzer is first you instrument the device model binary. So the device model is just a command line utility. You can pass some of the uh, arguments to configure, for example, the uh, graphics, uh, some, some of the, for example, the graphics configuration, things like uh, fence registers, uh, graphics hidden memory, memory aperture, and it allow you to assign some of the devices as you see in the minus S command. So we, we would give some of the virtual devices and, and, and enable them for a, for a user VM. It also allow you to configure memory sizes for the user VM. So that's how a, a device model worked. We took those configuration and we inject them to the lib fuzzer entry function, which is called LLVM fuzzer test one input. And this function, in our implementation does nothing but taking this uh, configuration DM file, try to transform it into a data structure and then inject one of the fuzzing input to one entry of this configuration file. Then we call the main function or, or the main function inside the device model that, that's the organic starting point for the device model. And then those fuzz input would be propagated to the parser or the part of the device model that is responsible to take those input and try to cut them into uh, smaller parts and propagate them to the main function. In case we have a crash, then this function would retain ba return back to the LLVM fuzzer one input function. If not, then it would continue to propagate those input to the other main functions, things like creating VMs or like loading the software or doing all the core parts of the device model to configure a VM. If this kind of operation works or fails, at the end, we would know because we would get feedback from such uh, binary or from the device model to this function. And then we would be able to mutate the input and tackle new parts of the device model code. So the first part of, of, of the, the function, as you see, is initializing those configuration based on fuzz input. And the second part is executing the main function based on the fuzz input. So libfuzzer has a lot of advantages being very fast. Uh, it's a standard tool, it's a state of art tool. It's uh, very easy to set up and it gives us also the possibility to enable different sanitizers, things like MSAN, AppSAN, KSAN and so on. One of the, or, or some of the disadvantage that we faced is that we could not really fuzz the back end emulation part of the device model using libfuzzer because there is a lot of validation that happens in other software layer things like the vhm or the hypervisor before we reach the, the, the device model and for that configuring libfuzzer to target the emulation back end would result in some kind of false positive which is not the best uh, approach also with libfuzzer, we might have to do a lot of code refactoring to remove any kind of exit statement. We need to do safe returns to the single entry function, which is the LLM fuzzer test one input. So this was libfuzzer and our experience with libfuzzer. The last component, which targets the three remaining interfaces in the guest, which is the uh, MMIO port IO kind of interfaces, which is considered very critical because a guest PM is not trusted in the Acron software stack. And for that, we used Hypercube or it's a research kind of OS uh, that do fuzzing in a different way other than syscaller and, and libfuzzer and all these tools. So Hypercube OS is a multi-dimensional fuzzer that is targeting more the low level software. It compose, it's consists of two main components. So one component that enumerates different interfaces. So enumerate the assigned PCI devices. It enumerates uh, things like the uh, local APIC, input, input output APIC and all this low level stuff. And also it contain a fuzz engine that after we enumerate those interfaces, 
we would be able to inject malicious or malformed uh, data into those interfaces. From integration perspective, it's very easy. So Hypercube lives as a normal guest. So it runs in any of the Acron scenario, either in industrial or IVI, it's nothing but triggering uh, a normal VM uh, using the device model and it lives on top of Acron to, to experience those different interfaces as we can see here. And from organization perspective, the, the Hypercube OS starts at the beginning by the device model. So as we start normal guests, if we want to start Hypercube, we have to define what kind of devices we want to test. And here we define some of the Virt.io devices that we think if we assign it to this guest and then run Hypercube, it would be able to fuzz them or inject bad input to those uh, devices or the memory map region related to those devices. So after Hypercube, Hypercube boots, it do some initialization, things like uh, setting the global descriptive table, the intra table and so on. And then it starts to register different regions. First, it starts with the PC, uh, uh, MMIO and port IO region. It then goes to the PCI devices. And if we see here, those are the PCI devices that we have assigned initially by the device model. It then tries to enumerate or register some of the uh, other regions like APIC and local APIC. It creates a fuzzer and then it uses um, an, an integrated kind of pseudo random uh, number generator in order to have a seed. And then we use the seed to start fuzzing. This was experience, our experience so far with different fuzzing tools and so on. So Stefan, maybe a bit about our future work and what's ahead. One second. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mustafa. Um, so as you heard, uh, Hypercube is quite easy to get started with, and it's actually a really nice tool to test the low-level interfaces of uh, for for the um, uh, the low-level VM interfaces of Acorn. Um, but the problem is that it is actually just a blind fuzzer, and we want to have uh, coverage feedback and uh, coverage guided fuzzing uh, using something like Hypercube. And the way forward that we are uh, looking into uh, for this direction is basically uh, kernel fuzzing using KFL. Um, KFL is another research prototype also from Ruhr University Bochum, the same people who also developed Hypercube. Um, and the idea of uh, KFL is actually to launch the target inside the virtual machine uh, using QMU and KVM, uh, uh, modified versions of them. And you would basically, again, you have a test driver that stimulates the target operating system inside the VM. It receives its input from uh, via shared memory from QMU and from the actual fuzzing front end. And then using Intel PT processor trace, we can get feedback uh, for each execution that is being uh, uh, decoded by QMO and returned back to the KSL further. The advantage of this is that it is uh, nicely scalable. It uses a well-known uh, interface, which is the virtual machine interface for uh, executing and um, scaling VMs in the VM backend. And in the latest version, which is called Nux, we also have advanced features such as very fast snapshotting uh, fuzzing of multiple interfaces, as well as uh, a notion of grammar or structured fuzzing of uh, the VMM targets. So in this case, Acorn would run as a nested hypervisor inside KVM, and we expect to achieve uh, this way the, the feedback also for the hypercube uh, fuzzing uh, case. So to summarize, um, we have seen that there is a range of targets that we need to pursue for Cisco Alert, uh, for Acorn, sorry. They are actually quite different in nature. There's the device model and user space, the hypervisor itself, and there's a kernel module, the VHM, and they all interact in interesting ways and uh, produce a number of security boundaries that have, have to have uh, good security testing. Uh, since Caller has been very promising on the kernel side and hypercore validation side, uh, while Hypercube has proven to be very effective and scalable on the guest VM side to validate from the perspective of the guest VM. Uh, 
And moving forward, we are uh, very interested to uh, run this experiment using KFL and NUX uh, using Hypercube as a, as a guest in a nested ACON setup. Uh, this fuzzer is very interesting to fuzz the command line interface and configurations that are possible with ACON. Um, but in general, it has been a little bit difficult to get it working for the device model, for the emulation of devices, which is in, in user space on the uh, service OS. All right, so overall, I think we've seen that there's a lot to be done for uh, improving fuzzing, even for low-level software. There's no tools that uh, cover all our bases. Um, but of course, we're working on it. We like to also collaborate with academia and other projects in this space and extend them. And uh, since this is an open source project, we also, of course, plan to upstream, integrate, and automate all of these uh, tools. Um, so with that, I thank you all for listening and um, we're interested to hear your questions and comments. Thank you. Thanks.